morning. We welcome you listeners on this August 9. I hope you got a little rain this morning. We got about two tenths of an inch in Nora Springs. We have Lisa and Lori and Brian today. I am Mary Snell and we have Pastor Carol with us today. Please join me in the call of worship. Scripture tells me to trust in the Lord with all my heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In everything I do, I should be mindful of God's help, and God will guide your steps. Hallelujah. Let us join in the hymn, Praise to the Lord Almighty, verses 1 through 3. what we ponder today as we come together and as we worship. And I ask that we would join in our unison prayer that is found in the bulletin. Dear God, in scripture you ask your followers to trust you. It is easy to trust the sun to rise in the morning, but our days are troubled, so it's hard for us to have hope for the future. Still, you continue to ask for our trust. You keep promising that because with you at our side, we are capable of solving problems and facing unforeseen challenges with a clear mind and a peaceful heart. We need to believe this is true. Help point us towards the same future that you see. Fix our eyes upon that image so that we can orient ourselves and move in your direction. Amen. And we sing the final two verses, uh, verses four and five of Praise to the Lord.
Music's Moments today. And I think today we have an opportunity to hear some special words about Vacation Bible School. And we have a special guest who is coming to be with us. Well, good morning, everyone. I am not the special guest. I am Lisa Bailey. For those who don't know me, I'm your director of Christian education. Thank you, Pastor Carol. We had a wonderful time at Vacation Bible School this past week. Greetings to all of the kids out there in Facebook land. I'm so happy to see you all. So, like I said, we just completed at home VBS 2020. Knights of the North Castle this past week, and my friend Sparky just couldn't bring himself to fly back to the North Castle just yet, and he is missing everyone desperately since we last gathered on Thursday evening. Sparky, Sparky, come on over. There you are. Hello to all of my new friends at First United Methodist Church in Mason City. I miss you all already. I so enjoyed our time together last week and I'm sad that it has come to an end. I must say though, you all have a fine bunch of young people who did an excellent job of finding all of the pieces to the full armor of God. They did do a fine job, Sparky, and I know they loved getting to know you, too. Our Bible verse for the week was from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Let's say it together, Knights. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Wonderful job, as always, Knights. Each night, we had a castle call-out that focused on and reminded our knights of the piece of armor for which they were searching. That's right, Lisa. Our knights were able to find the belt of truth, the breastplate of justice, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation. Our armor of God is complete. Yes, it is. They did a great job. So families came for a brief 10 to 15 minute drive-in opening in the parking lot, which we also showed on Facebook Live and posted to our page. Then they proceeded to go through a drive through lane to pick up their take-home kits. Each kit consisted of all the supplies they needed for a Bible craft, which was to make the actual piece of God's armor for the night supplies for a science experiment that went with the story, or the Bible story, and all the ingredients to make the snack for the evening. And I heard that the snacks were really yummy. They were. I heard the snacks were actually a favorite part. I think they were, Sparky. After getting their kits, families returned home and a video was posted to our Facebook page so the kids could follow along while they completed the activities. The kits also contained a packet with color pages, activity sheets, and a whole bunch of other stuff for them to do. Oh my, they were busy for sure. Can they still watch the videos, Lisa? Absolutely, Sparky. And if anyone would like a take-home kit, just give me a call at the church Tuesday through Friday and I will be sure to get one for you. I am going to miss you all so much, but I should really be getting back to the North Castle, Lisa. Thank you for all you have done, Sparky. Take care and God bless. And God bless you all as well. Goodbye. God bless you all. Thank you so much for joining us. And let me know if you need a kit. Bye, everybody.
you so much for sharing with us, Lisa, and for uh, all of the hard work that you put into Vacation Bible School. And I also have to uh, thank all the parents who, and grandparents and others who were committed to assuring their kids participated. That is a big commitment, and um, it only tells me how important it is to this church and to our families that the children be taught and to have the message of Jesus Christ and of the blessings of the church to be shared with children. You are so important to us. Amen. Amen. We come to the time in our service when we share um, in a word of prayer. And as we share our words of prayer, we are mindful of those who have been having some health issues. We are also mindful of uh, some death, of a death that took place in our church family this past week. And um, we know that there are others who have had family members and those who are close to them who have also faced many challenges this past week. And we're praying for you. And we pray for the um, unspoken concerns that you hold and you carry. But let us take just a few moments and offer these things to God. God, we will hear today a telling of the life of Joseph, the son of Jacob. And we will be reminded of how we have strayed, O oh Lord, how we have strayed from your will and your way like the brothers of Joseph. How there are times when we have betrayed our family and our friends for our own vainglory, and we have enslaved others to suit our purposes. We have lied to cover our tracks, and we have forgotten our faith when it's convenient. We have failed you and each other in oh so many times. Heal us, oh God. Heal us. Remind us the path to redemption is a path that leads through these things and takes us through that tunnel to another day. A day where we find ourselves at the foot of the cross. And that there is proof that your faithfulness never ends. That while we were yet sinners, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to shed his blood that we might not be cast down into a pit, but that we would rise. We would rise with him to everlasting life. We place our faith in these promises, and we place our hope in your proclamation that we have been forgiven of our sin and set free. So hear us, O Lord, as we come to you and we offer up the prayer that your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we sing, today we sing um, the first, in this last verse, we'll sing two verses of the song. Um, what number are we at, Brian? I don't have my bulletin. Okay, all verses of number 512. All right, all verses 512.
inviting me. We are about to move into scripture now, and we are going back to our dear book of Genesis. And we are about to move into the last telling in the book of Genesis regarding the great patriarchs of our faith. And this time we hear the story of Joseph. He is the later son of, uh, of our uh, friend Jacob, our flawed friend Jacob, whose name has been changed to Israel. Israel had two wives and two concubines, and his favored wife, Rachel, happened to be the mother of Joseph. And out of this household will come the 12 sons, who are the legendary 12 tribes of Israel. And we can talk about that at some other time, have a discussion about those connections, the 12 tribes of Israel. Being the oldest son of the favored wife means that Joseph may have been one of the youngest of these brothers, but he turns out to be the apple of his father's eye. And in dreams, it was revealed that he would be a chosen one of God in Joseph's dreams. And by being the chosen son of God, it doesn't necessarily translate into a life of peaches and cream. And the scripture lesson for today lines out an example of this. So listen to our words of scripture, but also pay attention to the actions of Reuben, who indeed is the oldest son in the house of Jacob, and is the oldest son of this band of 12 brothers. From Genesis 37, chapters 1 through 4 and 12 through 28. And I have it in large print here, so I'll hold my Bible and read here. Jacob Israel settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. And this is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons, his older brothers, the sons of Bilah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back to his father a bad report of them. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other children because he was the son of his old age. And he made for him a long robe with sleeves. And in the King James Version of the Bible, it's called a, a multicolored coat. But when his brother saw that their father loved him more than all of his other brothers, they hated him. And they could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the, shop, the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you. And Joseph answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now. See if it is well with your brothers and with the flock. And bring word back to me. Remember, he's tattled on his brother's report before, so Israel's trying to keep track of what these brothers are doing. So he sent Joseph from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem, and he found a man wandering there in the fields, and the man asked him, what are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? The man said, Well, they've gone on away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers, and he found them at Dothan. Now the brothers, they saw him at a distance. And before he came near, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come on now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we'll see what's become of all his crazy dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands by saying, well, let's not take his life. 
Reuben said, let's not shed blood. Let's just throw him into a pit here in the wilderness, but let's not lay any hands on him. That, and he said this because, scripture readers, Reuben thought that he might rescue Joseph out of that pit and restore him to his father at a later time. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with the sleeves that he wore, and they took him and they threw him in that pit. The pit was empty. There wasn't any water in it. And they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to take it down to Egypt. And then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And the brothers agreed. When some Midianite tra tra traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, and lifting him out of the pit, they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they, the Midianites took Joseph to Egypt. May God add God's blessing and inspiration to this our sacred text. Let us pray. Oh God, you have given us this wonderful scripture again, telling of families and of the troubles that families can cause for each other, and yet the way that you can sometimes use trouble for good. And so we ask, O oh Lord, that you would hide me in the shadow of your cross, that the words we speak would be words of truth, and there might be a bit of inspiration from you that shines forth in their midst. Amen. Well, as I've said, I have enjoyed this opportunity to unpack the stories from the book of Genesis and the house of Jacob specifically with you to, um, through this series of sermons that we've been doing over um, July and now into August. And it has impressed upon me that there really is no one way to read and interpret these tellings because every single one of us comes to them with our own set of eyes and our own experiences. And those things are the tools that we use to unpack these texts and to give them meaning, meaning that's significant to our own situation. And I think this in part of what it means to say that the scripture is the living word of God. It is a living word that speaks even today. And certainly this story of Joseph and his brothers seeks to speak to us. The passage that I read to you begins the telling of the wonderful life, the um, you know, remember the book, the, the book, The Perils of Penelope Pitstop? It could be The Perils of Joseph Pitstop. Jo uh, Jacob's favored son. His life is a life of adventure. He may turn into our favorite son, too. And certainly was it Andrew Lloyd Webber who wrote the musical Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat? Um, he's a wonder to behold. For sure. And I know I've already dashed your hopes by telling you that Joseph's coat was not technicolored, but believe me, it was fancy. And then the scripture that I selected skips right over the wonderful and overly ambitious dreams that Joseph dreamt, that God gave Joseph to dream of all 11 of his brothers bowing down. Uh, to Joseph as head of the clan, for instance, of him being the savior for all who lived in the promised land. For instance, see, this one had ambition. It is my assumption that his brothers have seen it as their duty to keep Joseph humble. Humble. Have you heard that said about someone you know? Keep that one humble. So here comes my question one more time. Is it 
good or is it bad to have these big dreams? Is it good or is it bad to be blessed by God? We stopped at the place where the brothers have tossed that not, that no good, too proud of himself kid Jacob into a well. And he has been sold into servanthood, bound to Egypt. And that very well could have been the end of the story for Joseph, the dreamer. But it's not going to be, because God's going to have a great big climax in mind for this story. It's something that no one could ever forecast, no one could ever see, not certainly Joseph as he's sitting in the bottom of that pit. But I don't want to preach a sermon that's ahead of us in this text. Because the situation at hand is pretty dismal, don't you think? The scripture will follow Joseph and get us to a better place. But it is so clear that this family is in trouble with a capital T. This band of brothers will go home. They'll have a long talk with their father. Their father's heart is going to be broken. And the one who dreams all these wonderful dreams for them, he isn't going to do that anymore. What's it like to be a part of a family that has no dreams? As I noted, this, this young Joseph didn't actually get a Technicolor dream coat from his father. But he did get this coat with these long sleeves that hang, kind of like the choir wears, these long bell sleeves. And think about it, there's a message in that coat. His brothers could see that message. His brothers work in the fields. They are manhandling livestock, they are threshing wheat, they are hauling water, they are helping calves give birth. These men have to work bare-chested, or at least with short sleeves on over their arms. But for Jacob to give Joseph a coat with long bell sleeves means that just Jacob intended for Joseph's life to be one that will be lived in the house, the billowy house, not in the field. He'll be in the shade sipping the iced tea while his brothers sweat. I tend to think that the brothers didn't necessarily resent that Joseph had Israel's favor that way. They just simply wanted to be loved like that too. They just wanted that love. Have you noticed that Genesis is utterly lacking in sweet, happy families. It reminds me of the way that Tolstoy opens up the novel Anna Katrina by saying, happy families are all alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. But let's talk just a moment. Let's talk just a moment about that oldest brother, Reuben. He's a leader in this band of brothers. He's the oldest brother. He may not be the son that's chosen by God, but he is chosen by these other brothers to lead them. And I say that because they listen to him. And you see that in the scripture. If Reuben hadn't spoken up, Joseph wouldn't have made it out of that pit at all. The story would have been over. And when I think about it, when I think about Reuben, I think a little bit about a Mel Gibson movie, believe it or not. Um, the Man Without a Face. Uh, in, in that movie, Mel Gibson has been in this horrible accident, and his face has been terribly disfigured. And he's a teacher. And um, he begins working in the summer one-on-one -on -one with a student by the name of Charles. And at first, that's a very tough relationship because, you know, you can imagine the students in the school and how they feel about this, this teacher. And 
what they say about this teacher, but it's over the summer, and they develop this one-to-one -one relationship, and it becomes a really positive relationship, and Charles begins to flourish underneath the um, guidance and direction of Mel Gibson, the teacher. Once he can over overcome his fear, the appearance, it's a great learning relationship. But when his friends, who view this teacher as a freak, ask him about those sessions, Charles responds by saying, well, he's pretty cool for, for a hamburger head. See, Charles just can't quite be a stand-up guy. He can't fully do the right thing. The band of brothers, their chosen leader, Reuben, is the same. He's able to talk the brothers out of killing Joseph, but he can't stick up for his brother all the way either. In a side note, as I said, Scripture says that Reuben makes this plan that once the boys cool down, he'll go back and he'll fetch Joseph out of that well, but he doesn't get that choice. It causes me to ask, if that was on Reuben's heart, then why didn't he do the right thing? Why didn't he stick up for his brother? Why didn't he say, yes, Joseph is a dreamer, he's spoiled, and he's a knucklehead, but he's our dreamy, spoiled knucklehead. You guys are going too far. Why didn't he say that? I think the brothers would have listened to him. But Reuben didn't do it, and the situation for Joseph and the whole family took a bad turn. Now I want to ask you, have you ever stood in Reuben's shoes? Are there times when you have had an opportunity to stand up for someone who needed a friend, or maybe a protector, at work, or at school, or in the neighborhood? Was there a little voice whispering in your ear, urging you to step up or to speak up, but you did not? Maybe you did halfway in that you didn't fully join in the laughter, or you were quiet, or you found a way to change the topic and or divert attention. But was that enough? It leaves me to ask myself, what makes it so hard to stand up for crazy dreamers or for the ones who have been scarred by life or others who simply don't deserve the way that people speak about them? What, were, what would happen if we were mindful of Reuben who for the rest of his life carried this guilt for not saying are doing enough on behalf of that crazy kid brother of his, Joseph. Now, fortunate for Reuben, God intervenes in here gives this story a curve that no one sees coming, and there's going to be an opportunity for Reuben and his brothers to be absolved of their guilt. You'll hear about that next week. But even more wonderful is that you have an opportunity to be absolved yourselves at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. But the point for today is that the God who urged Reuben to stand up and to speak out for those who cannot stand up and speak out for themselves is the God who wants every single one of us to do this. Last week, Brian, Brian read a poem by Langston Hughes that speaks so wonderfully to this ambitious dream that it, it, it spoke so wonderfully to the ambitious dreamers that are in our world yet today. Because you see, our, our generation today too, we can call them spoiled. We can call them dreamers. We can say they don't know how to work. But you know what? They have a message of hope. And they have a message of promise. And they have a direction 
for us to be following. And he read a poem that's written by Langston Hughes, which says, I dream a world where man, no other man will scorn, where our love will bless the earth and peace its paths adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul, nor avarice blights our way. A world I dream where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth and everyone is free. Where wretchedness will hang its head and joy like a pearl attend the needs of all mankind. Of such I dream my world. And as we prepare to leave this sanctuary, I want you to leave with the image of Joseph who is in that pit being sold off to the enemy. I want you to leave with this Joseph who can't help it but dream, even when he's in a fix like that. Because it appears like the world that he's in, he's in the worst of all ways. But there's something inside of him that says, you gotta hang on, boy. Because God is still giving you dreams. And God is still nudging people like your brother Reuben to move into action. And Joseph is going to stand up for the faith. And Reuben is going to lead by making better decisions too. And there will be a light that's going to shine for dear Joseph and his production predicament, just like it's going to shine for Reuben and the brothers and their father too. And I say if God can do that, then there are dreamers and there are dreams that God has for you and for our beloved community, for our beloved community that are meant to give us a future with hope too. So stay tuned, hang on, and hold on, and wait for God's light to shine. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we have strayed from your will and from your way. Like the brothers of Joseph, we have betrayed family and friends for our own vain glory. We have enslaved others to suit our purposes, and we have lied to cover our tracks. We've forgotten our faith when it's convenient, and we have failed you and each other so many times. Heal us, O oh God. And show us the proof that your faithfulness never ends. That even while we were yet sinners, point us to see your Son, the Son that you sent, the one who shed his blood for our sins, that we might not be cast down into that pit, but that we might rise with him into everlasting glory. Amen. We come to near the end of our service of worship, and as we do, I want to be mindful. Um, I want to be mindful to say to you that you are deeply appreciated. That the work that you do and the way that you have been supportive of the church is also appreciated. That when you offer a testimony, when you point people towards the work that we're doing, the ministry that we're providing, when you have hope for a future for us and see a vision for ministry that we can do and be while the church is not in the building but out in the community, that is a dream that we need to hear and a dream that we need to believe is God's voice speaking, not through your readers but through the people who God is calling to this place. And um, it is your gifts, your monetary gifts, your gifts of presence, and the gifts of your prayers that continue to move us forward. And so when we pray and sing, when we sing the next song, which is Here I Am, Lord, number 593, um, sing it as your own prayer. And ask God what God is calling you to be and God is calling you to do when you're being called to this place 
and to hold the world in your hands. Here I am, Lord. May the Lord of promise and all newness live in your hearts with, and guide you in peaceful ways and fearless speaking. In the name of Christ, amen. amen.